here Paul and I are going to have a little chat uh, about uh, one of the big macroeconomic issues uh, and this is economic growth. I'm often arguing with people about exactly what economic growth is and so let me set out what I think economic growth is and, and what I think is often a, a confusion about growth and then obviously let Paul come in and, and put me right uh, on this. Um, as far as I'm concerned economic growth is the definition in the textbooks is an increase in productive capacity per capita which more or less means can we produce more with the same amount of resources so economic growth is about this it isn't about growing the economy through macroeconomic management through Keynesian policies through closing output gaps which I think is often a mistake the economy certainly grows if we have high unemployment and we can fiscally stimulate the economy uh, to create more employment then real national income will grow but from my point of view that's just moving from a point inside what's called the production possibility curve what's the maximum we can produce given the resources we have available to us towards this boundary and it's not economic growth but it is growth in the economy and that shouldn't be confused with you know, what real economic growth is it's people having ideas it's inventions it's innovations it's people saying if we do it this way we're going to be able to produce more if we do it this way it's going to be more profitable if we do it this way the costs are going to fall so that's to me what economic growth is so whenever I'm describing economic growth I'm always trying to look at what it is that allows an economy to expand uh, through increasing your capacity to produce per unit of input uh, into uh, that capacity do you see the same separation, Paul, between growth and economic growth, or, or would you mix these? I do, but I, I would use slightly different words. Um, so I would think about the supply side and demand side of the economy, and what you're calling economic growth I would call the supply potential of the economy. And the thing about that is, if you look at, say, um, UK GDP up to about 2007-8, over 100, 150 years, you can fit pretty much a log-linear trend through the data. You have to adjust a little bit for the World Wars, but broadly speaking, and there was a catch-up period after the Second World War, but broadly speaking, we've had roughly constant economic growth for a very long time. And we got used to thinking of that as a fixed trend, and that was the supply-side potential of the economy, which was generated by a combination of population growth and technical progress. And that should be relatively unchanging. And so the, the macroeconomic problem was defined for a long time to be the movement in demand away from that potential. Uh, and sometimes the economy would be going too fast and sometimes it would be going uh, uh, too, too slow. And so monetary policy in particular, post-inflation um, targeting, became about trying to move demand back in line with supply potential so as to keep inflation in check. And that, and that seemed to work, and so it, w it worked pretty well. Unfortunately, all the big challenges that we have seen in the last 20 years have come not from demand fluctuations but from supply side shocks and you can go back to things like the Asian crisis in the late 90s the great financial crisis which had an element of a supply side shock coming from the financial sector the pandemic effect which is principally a supply side shock and supply side shocks are very much harder to deal with if, if you have demand growing too fast or too slow you tighten policy or you loosen policy appropriately and everything comes back to normal when you have a supply side shock, actually the definition of it is that inflation goes up and output goes down, typically. And then it's very hard to do to know what to do. Do you tighten policy and risk making the output fall bigger, or do you loosen policy and risk making the inflation response higher? Uh, and so you have to try and work your way through that. Now, so that was already quite difficult uh, by the time we got the great financial crisis. The problem since then is the economy simply hasn't recovered to its pre-crisis trend. We've lost output that we don't seem to be able to recover. So this idea of a f fixed supply side trend seems to have gone. Um, and if the supply side has gone and we can no longer rely on it being a fixed trend, it's going to be much, much harder to work out exactly where the economy should be. So demand management is going to become much more fraught. Um, uh, but yes, certainly where I do very much agree with you, simply trying to get an ever faster increase in GDP 
is not a sustainable policy. It's not necessarily real economic growth. You can make it happen for a short while, but typically you will make it happen mm. and then the economy will crash and burn. And that is that still very much applies, even though we're finding it difficult to know where the supply side of the economy mm. should be. See, I always think of supply side shocks as being a little bit of a cop out. Um, to me, looking back over the last 50 years, I see lots of demand side shocks. The supply side shocks are always there uh, in an economy. And I think that they have been blamed for something that they didn't actually cause. Paul is quite right. If you go back post um, World War II, you, you find that, that growth sort of settled uh, around the 3% level a year and things were relatively stable. I argue because initially the economy was relatively stable under the gold uh, exchange standard, but we'll, we may deal with that uh, in, uh, in another chat. And when we get to the end of the 60s, you, you had uh, a group of economists, uh, uh, the Keynesian economists, who thought that we could grow the economy faster by manipulating and stimulating demand, mainly through fiscal policy. And if you look back over the 50s and 60s and say you're looking at uh, economic growth of around 2.5-3% a year, their target was 5%. So they wanted the economy to grow 5% a year through the 70s and they felt that they could stimulate demand and sustain that demand to grow the economy uh, at that rate. And I think that was the shock. I don't think there were oil shocks that had uh, that impact. I don't think that there were uh, trade unions that had the impact which drove the 70s. I think it was an attempt by uh, politicians guided by Keynesian economists to grow the economy faster through fiscal stimulation with an accommodating monetary policy. It didn't work. And if you look at the 70s, uh, then rather than achieve economic growth at um, a level of 5%, uh, I think, uh, again, people may disagree about statistics, but the last figures I looked at, we grew at 0.6% a year during the 70s when we were actively trying to grow the economy faster. And I think that problem has been sustained ever since, that governments are persuaded that they can do things in terms of their spending and their taxation policy and their borrowing to grow the economy faster. And I think that's the biggest shock to the system is governments trying to grow the economy faster. And every attempt that they have ever made has led to the economy growing more slowly. So much so that really in the last decade, uh, you're not looking at any sustainable growth. You're looking at damage recovery, damage recovery, you're not really looking at any economic growth at all because I do feel very strongly that we are using the the wrong policies. Now before I ask Paul just to come back on that, um, it, it would be interesting for, to hear Paul's take on whether he thinks economic growth is actually important because I do think that economic growth is important because it is the only way that living standards are going to rise for everybody. Uh, you know, a little thought experiment, if there's no economic growth and we've all got the same amount to share, if uh, one group of people want to become better off, they can only do it by making another group of people worse off. The only way we can all become better off and have higher living standards if the economy grows. So I think it's that important that we need to be looking very carefully and pursuing policies which bring about economic growth in a sustainable way, uh, not continually trying to do something which I think actually damages the growth rate. Well, just on, on is economic growth important first? I think it is because what I see around me is that what, what makes people happy, it's not the level of income or the level of output in the economy, it's the fact that things get better every year. If things are getting better every year, most people are reasonably happy. If things stagnate, even if people are as well, as well off as they've always been, they tend to get unhappy. But what we're talking about here in terms of economic growth is not the same as simple GDP growth. What we should really be focused on is living standards. So, for example, if you could produce the same amount of output by spending less time at work and having more leisure time, that would be a definite improvement in living standards, even though GDP wouldn't go up at all. 
you know, your income wouldn't go up at all either, but you'd be better off, yeah. never, nevertheless. And I think we need to start thinking more, particularly as manufacturing um, output and things have got less and less important in GDP anyway. In the UK, manufacturing is only about 10% of the economy. Most of what we consume is services, and increasingly it's becoming digital services, not even just personal services. And so we need to think about the concept of economic growth um, and making the uh, environment, for example, a better place in which to live is definitely economic growth, even if it's not reflected in GDP. Now, just going back to um, what's happened in history, I agree with some of what John says, but not all of it. And so the oil shocks in the 70s were very definitely real supply shocks. It was a cartel jacking up the price of one of the world's most uh, precious basic commodities, and that definitely had very significant uh, effects. But it had different effects in different countries. Uh, and we didn't do particularly well in the UK. Uh, we took it in inflation when we, we didn't necessarily need to. Uh, and what I would say is this. The, the UK economy had grown reasonably quickly since the Second World War, but that was because of economic catch-up. Essentially, the Second World War knocks back the actual growth from the potential, and therefore you can grow faster for a while until it catches up. And that we hit that barrier about the mid-60s. And then suddenly we started to hit economic problems. People thought the economy could grow at 3% or, or more, and it couldn't. The long-run growth rate over, say, 100 years or so, even up to that point, had only been about two and a quarter. And if you look on the long historical spectrum, that is about roughly what it comes out to when you take into account normal population growth and a mature economy and a certain amount of technical progress. And many advanced economies have settled down to around 2% or lower if their population rates, growth rates are lower. So that's about the best we could achieve, that 2%. And where people have tried to get um, output to grow faster than that, it's normally been a crash and burn failure. I think since the advent of inflation targeting, that has been less the problem. You could argue that people still get fault. That pre-GFC um, uh, period in the early 2000s, I think people generally thought that growth had been uh, miraculously higher. Uh, and I remember listening to colleagues from the US saying, oh, we're, we're increasing our estimate of the natural growth rate from sort of 3 to 3 and a quarter to 3.5%. No, it was always 2. Uh, and, and the US had very similar problems to the UK with... Um, an overvalued exchange rate in a growing current account deficit through much of that period as a result. So we do need to be realistic about what the true underlying growth rate is. It's only about 2%, and attempts to run the economy faster than that will result in, in failure. Now, funny enough, we have had 2% since the great financial crisis, but we haven't had the catch-up that we should have had after such a big downturn in output. It'll be interesting to see what happens now after the pandemic. Do we have a faster mm. period of growth for a while catching up the lost output? Or do actually do we circle back again to this 2% and, and stick there? Yeah. So that, that's quite an important point because quite a lot of economists talk about uh, now we're going through a very fast rate of economic growth. To my mind, we're not. We're in a situation where we're recovering and recovering from one peak and coming back to uh, that level again is not economic growth as far as I'm concerned. It, it is just recovery. And if you start your measure from the lowest point, then every year you're going to get economic growth. But I wouldn't start my measure at the lowest point. I would take my measure from the point that you fell from, if you like, the highest point. Uh, and I think it's important to see things like that. And if you do look at that, then I, I see economic growth rates as being very much lower than they could otherwise have been. And it I'm very much concerned that it's government macroeconomic policies trying to boost the economy have the very opposite effect. They tend to draw resources uh, to the public sector and unfortunately I always associate public sector spending and government spending with inefficiency and waste. Um, uh, I'm sure Paul won't uh, agree with that but I see uh, if you like, the private sector is inefficient and, and wasteful, but whenever the private sector is inefficient and wasteful, it goes out of business. Whenever the public sector is inefficient and wasteful, the solution is, well, let's add a little bit more spending here and see if we can make this better rather than, uh, than we should give up. So I'm certain that as 
governments have done more and more and more to try and boost the economy, they've had the very opposite effect. They've wasted more resources and they've brought growth rates down. So I don't see them um, acting uh, in that way to, to raise growth. I see very much a situation where let's push government aside. Let's give the private sector of the economy the opportunity to grow more quickly. Let's not interfere. Let's minimise the rules. Let's market prices prevail. And market prices prevailing does tend to solve problems. If you go back to what Paul referred to as the oil shocks, there was at that time uh, a feeling that we had better ration oil, ration petrol, and uh, subsidise, keep petrol prices down to compensate for the quadrupling of oil prices as OPEC, uh, the oil cartel, was set up. We didn't do that. We let oil prices rise. And of course, the market then starts to sort things out because higher oil prices meant people started to invent engines that used uh, less petrol. Uh, they started to think about alternative ways uh, of providing energy. And if the price mechanism was working, it did the right job. Uh, the supply shock, if you like, uh, pushed the private sector to respond. I worry at this moment we've got an energy crisis, we've got higher gas prices, we've got higher um, energy prices, but we have price caps. We're not letting the prices adjust upwards, which gives everyone the incentive to try and uh, push for more efficient ways of, of using things. We have insulate Britain, don't we, sitting on uh, uh, motorways uh, trying to force governments to insulate uh, the country. Uh, whereas, of course, we'd all do it ourselves if energy price, if the uh, uh, the gas price uh, and energy prices double over this year, people will go. It's about time we insulated our house, isn't it? Or we improved our insulation. But try and keep those prices down and get a government to say you insulate everybody and, and keep prices down. To me, is not a way to grow an economy. It's a way to waste resources, and. It really takes us to a point where I want to see economic growth, but I want to see economic growth that is sustainable, that is not manipulated uh, by government, is not um, fiscal and monetary policy. It's the private sector inventing things, innovating, uh, responding to supply shocks whenever they occur and, and looking, if you like, for a market solution. I know you would like it to be sustainable, yeah. wouldn't you? But I'd like it to be sustainable. But I think I have a slightly different view of the private sector. What I see in the private sector is um, a lot of market inefficiency, a lot of imperfections. Um, mar people in the private sector love to try and create monopolistic conditions under which they can control prices and output. They don't like competition. You look at UK industry, it's very heavily concentrated with a few big firms in each, each sector. And governments need to take action to make markets work. Capitalism left to its own devices drives you into some uh, corners in which some people get very rich and the majority don't. And I think we need to set, uh, set conditions so that there are competitive fair markets if we want to get those benefits of the private sector setting prices and allocating uh, resources efficiently. And we allow vested interests too much say and we, we don't allow enough change. So I will take a slightly different view, but it does. It is one in which the government has a duty to set the conditions for private sector competition. Um, and there will be some situations where you have natural monopolies, in which case you can't leave it in private sector hands. You have to have uh, state intervention uh, in order to ensure um, the best um, social outcome. And although it sounds as though we're saying different things, I, I think the, the, there's a lot of agreement here in what we're saying, because... Obviously, if you, unfettered capitalism, if you like, does tend to, to lead to the law of the jungle, if you like, and the rich become very rich by abusing uh, uh, the less able, uh, the poorer. Um, and that's not a situation you want. For, for me, that's what governments should be doing. They should be creating rules and regulations which stop these things happening, which stop vested interests, which stop monopolies developing, which stop very large firms having political influence, stop lobbying, uh, stop uh, giving preferential treatment to, to those companies that uh, uh, contribute most to political parties or whatever it may be. I think both Paul and I would like to see uh, 
this level playing field out there. And we both agree capitalism left without any rules and regulations is not the type of world that you would want to live in. But equally, what I would call crony capitalism is not the type of society in which I want to live in either, where there are vested interests and the more powerful you are, the more you can draw resources towards yourself and your own benefit. I do want to see lots of competition out there. I don't like to see monopolies. I don't like to see people in powerful positions. Um, and I think that those are the best conditions for economic growth. We, there's one other thing I would quite like to, to say to Paul before we finish, and this is something that I uh, often hear and, uh, and teach about, and that is that as the economy grows faster and we use up more resources, are we not creating a, a doomsday scenario where suddenly uh, all of these resources are going to run out, we're going to become short of natural resources, uh, and because that might happen, we should be much more sparing and much more careful, not to try and grow, but to try and use uh, all the resources that we have available to us uh, in, uh, in a better way. Do you want to comment on that? Yeah. I'll, 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 go, you go it's it's certainly true we can't keep producing more stuff. Um, you can't keep producing more things because there's only a finite number of natural resources on, on the planet. However, there are ways to deal with this. First of all, we're seeing demand shift uh, away from things and towards having nice living conditions and um, a better environment in which to live in rather than necessarily having uh, more throwaway items. Uh, in particular, there's the notion of the circular economy in which you um, not just recycle, but reuse, refurbish. Um, you harvest parts from things when you really can't use them anymore. Uh, and you absolutely minimise what goes into landfill uh, in that way, so that you're not ever making a bigger drain on more resources. You're, you're trying to keep it constant. And also being more efficient, um, using less stuff to make the same thing. So there's quite a lot you can do uh, within that. There's quite a lot you can do in terms of improving living, people's living standards without draining on the resources of the planet. Crucial to that is that population growth stabilises, and on current trends it looks like it look like it will later later this century, it may even go into reverse, because the when you get mature developed economies, the reproduction rate seems to settle down to below two per a fertile female as they as they say, about one point eight, and that actually could give you falling population. So it's not that but people often say, Oh, it's going to be too costly to do something about saving the planet and that's if you like, it's a silly proposition. Because the most costly thing you can do is nothing. <laughs> Uh, because eventually you will run out of resources, uh, the sea level will continue to rise, the planet will continue to get what uh, hotter, and uh, millions if not billions of people would die as a result. That, that's got to be the most costly outcome. So we do need to invest in, in the future, and this is where I think public investment will have a big role to play. Um, one of my complaints about fiscal policy is it's too easy to reduce in public investment relative to public expenditure. And public investment in the future is, is what we we so desperately need uh, in terms of improving infrastructure, improving living standards um, uh, for everybody. And there's all sorts of things we can be different, be doing different. Most of our homes could be powered with local energy supply, at least a large part of the time. Uh, most of our cars could be using renewable energy and so on. Um, there's, there's quite a lot we could do. I agree with you um, that there is a lot that can be done. I think the point of disagreement is that I do feel that economic growth is the very engine that will allow us to look and do all these beneficial things. Uh, I am not wor as worried as Paul is about running out of resources. Mark if you let markets work, they deal with those things because as you get less and less resources, so their price goes up and it gets much more profitable for look, to look to alternative ways of doing things. And those alternative ways are ways which don't use these resources. Uh, rightly or wrongly, I always say to my students, if you let uh, oil prices uh, just rise, you let petrol prices rise, then we will all not be using um, petrol engines. Things will just automatically move to much more efficient and cheaper ways of providing energy. Uh, and we won't be using the oil to finance uh, uh, 
uh, our, our engines, uh, or sorry, run our engines in the years to come. And interfering with prices again comes down in my mind to a mistake. And if we just let prices, profit motive, um, rules and regulations with level playing fields, then a lot of our problems will be overcome and funds will be released, if you like, to government through this growth to be able to do the sort of things that Paul uh, wants to do. And the one thing that worries me is that as we go into the future, we might spend a lot of time trying to do good and end up uh, wasting resources even more and creating the very problem uh, that uh, we're trying to overcome. It's quite nice for me to have access to switching off here because I can finish now on what I said and not ask Paul to make any further comments on this. So I'll press the button now and we'll come back and... Oh, you want to say something, do you? No. Oh, good. I'll press the button and uh, we'll come back on something else.